Today we're going to pick up with our series on the four Gospels, the four historical accounts we have of the life and teachings of Jesus, four different witnesses. And I think I've got a little bit of a surprise for you today because one of these Gospels might be written by somebody you didn't expect. Today we're going to come back to the series we're doing on the four Gospels, who wrote them, why they wrote them, and what you should be looking for when you read them. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, you might want to go back and listen to parts one and two so that you get a more comprehensive experience, a better overview of what we're trying to accomplish. Today we're going to have a look at the earliest of the four accounts, which carries the name of Mark. We're pretty sure this was the first of the Gospels to be written, and a lot of Bible scholars actually suspect that Matthew and Luke used Mark's Gospel as an outline for their own, taking his rather bare-bones account and expanding it with more detail when they thought a broader picture might be useful. Mark's Gospel was likely written sometime in the 60s AD, fairly close to the time of the Apostle Peter's death, which took place during the reign of Nero in 64 AD. After being held in the Mamertine prison, right beside the ancient Roman Forum, Peter was taken out of the city to Vatican Hill where they crucified him. Now, legend says that when the great apostle saw his cross, he began to cry. Not because he was afraid of it, but because he thought the cross was too good for him. That's the way Jesus died, he said, and I really don't deserve that. So the Romans obliged him and crucified him upside down. That's the reason you see upside-down crosses in the Mamertine prison to this day. Now, Jesus actually predicted how Peter would die, and you find it in John chapter 21. Right after Jesus forgives Peter for betraying him, this is what he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. So, of course, some of you are wondering what in the world that has to do with the Gospel of Mark. Well, actually, it might have a lot to do with it, because even though the author of the Gospel is identified as John Mark, we have a good deal of evidence that the content came from Peter. Historically, we believe that John Mark probably lived in the house where the apostles met in the upper room shortly after the resurrection, and it became a center for the first Christian church in the city of Jerusalem. In fact, there is some speculation that Mark was the young man who fled naked into the night on the evening that Jesus was arrested. After the disciples abandoned Christ on that faithful night, the Gospel of Mark records this. It says, Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. So. What most people think is that Mark was living in the house where the Last Supper took place. And when Jesus and the disciples left the premises, he was curious enough to get out of bed, wrap himself in a sheet, and follow them. But when trouble broke out and the disciples suddenly disappeared, the arresting party grabbed Mark instead. So he escaped their grasp by slipping out of the sheet and running back home. And I guess the reason most people think it was John Mark is because it's such a random incident, and it doesn't appear to be related to the rest of the story. I mean, it doesn't even mention the young man's name, which makes it really unlikely that it was one of the twelve disciples. So one of the most reasonable conclusions is that John Mark slipped this cameo into the story because it was his only involvement in the life of Jesus before the resurrection and the birth of the Christian church. And the fact that he left his name out of the story only heightens the suspicion that it's him, because it wasn't uncommon in those days to humbly skip your own name when you were writing about yourself. So, who really knows? John Mark might just be the streaking evangelist. Now, as a young man, John Mark became intimately involved with the work of the apostles, joining Paul and Barnabas during their first missionary journey. Acts chapter 15 tells us there was a falling out between Paul and Barnabas, and so they parted company, and Mark went with Barnabas to Cyprus. 
Later on, he went to work for Peter, who ended up in the city of Rome. And John Mark served as a translator because, of course, Peter was uneducated. So what we think happened is that the Christians in Rome became concerned that Peter was getting older. And when Peter was gone, his sermons, which were full of stories about Jesus, well, those sermons would disappear, and of course, that would be a huge loss. So we think the believers urged John Mark to write these stories down, which gave us the gospel according to Mark. Or maybe, more accurately, the gospel according to Peter. Of course, it's quite a leap to just assume that Mark was recording Peter's thoughts and preserving them in Greek, but the record of history seems to confirm this idea. Eusebius, in his 4th century history of the church, said this about Peter's preaching. He wrote, And so greatly did the splendor of piety illumine the minds of Peter's hearers that they were not satisfied with hearing only once and were not content with the unwritten teaching of the divine gospel. But with all sorts of entreaties, they besought Mark, a follower of Peter, and the one whose gospel is extant, that he would leave them a written monument of the doctrine which had been orally communicated to them. Nor did they cease until they had prevailed with the man and had thus become the occasion of the written gospel which bears the name of Mark. The early church father Irenaeus, writing in the second century, said pretty much the same thing. Here's what he wrote. Matthew composed his gospel among the Hebrews in their own language, while Peter and Paul proclaimed the gospel in Rome and founded the community. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, handed on his preaching to us in written form. Now, those are hardly the only accounts we have. Clement, Origen, Tertullian, Justin Martyr. It seems as if the unanimous understanding of the early Christian church was that Mark's gospel is really Peter's gospel and that Mark was working as Peter's secretary. And sure enough, when you read the letters that do carry Peter's name, you find him mentioning John Mark with a note of fondness. I mean, just listen to how Peter's first letter ends. He writes, she who is in Babylon, and that was code for the city of Rome back in those days. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Now, it wasn't his literal son, but it gives you an idea of how much Peter prized this gifted young writer. And when you read the account that Mark left behind, it certainly seems to match Peter's personality, and it does it perfectly. It's a gospel full of action, much like the hot-headed disciple was himself. It focuses on what Jesus did more than what Jesus said, and it appears to be aimed at non-believers, trying to convince them to consider the claims of Christ. And the book does contain another little hint that this might actually be the teaching of Peter. It doesn't waste much time trying to preserve Peter's reputation. The other Gospels mention the restoration of Peter on the beach, how Jesus forgave him for the betrayal. But in this account, we only have the story of the betrayal itself, and the restoration is never mentioned. So if Peter is the real author of this book, he appears to be downplaying his own importance, which makes a lot of sense. But now it's time for a quick break, so you can run and get a copy of the Bible, so you can follow along, and I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. When we started this series on the four Gospels, I mentioned an ancient church tradition, an understanding that Christians used to have that the four evangelists, the four gospel writers, represent the four faces you find on the cherubim in the books of Ezekiel and Revelation. Matthew is the face of the lion because he demonstrates the kingship of Christ and proves that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Luke zeroes in on the humanity of Christ, which makes him the face of a man. John unpacks the deity of Christ and takes his audience up to the heavens, and that makes him the face of the eagle. But then Mark, or we think Peter, gives us a careful study of what Jesus did, how he patiently labored for humanity like an ox in the field. 
which makes this gospel the face of the ox or the calf. The Gospel of Mark is a brief record of the acts of Jesus, which means you'll find a lot less of what Jesus said. So if you happen to have a red letter edition of the Bible, you'll notice there's less red ink in Mark than there is in Matthew or Luke. And the story starts at the beginning of Jesus' ministry with His baptism at the moment when Jesus starts doing things. There's no Christmas story in Mark's Gospel, no mention of Christ's birth, no genealogy like you find in Luke or Matthew. There's just a lot of action. In fact, there are 18 miracles recorded in Mark's book and only four parables and one major sermon. When you compare that to Matthew, you'll see what I mean when I call this the action gospel. There's a popular preacher in England that I sometimes like listening to, and he points out that there is an interesting geographical component to the Gospel of Mark. The story starts at the Jordan River, one of the lowest points in Palestine, and then it slowly moves uphill to Galilee, and then up to Mount Hermon, until it finally brings us up to Caesarea Philippi, where we find the biggest moment in Mark's account, the turning point of his whole narrative. Caesarea Philippi had a shrine dedicated to the pagan god Pan, you know, the character that was half man and half goat and played a set of pipes. And this shrine was located by a natural spring that came out of the mountain. Pan was the pagan god of desolate places, and it was said that he came down to earth in the form of a man. Now, in later years, one of Herod's sons, Philip, put a statue of the Roman Caesar in this same spot, which is why they called it Caesarea Philippi, because it's where Philip was honoring the Caesar. And of course, the Caesar, to Roman understanding, was a man who claimed to be a god. So in this one spot, we have a pagan god who becomes a man, and then we have a man who thinks he's a god. And this is where Jesus chooses to ask his disciples a really important question. Here's the story as you find it in Mark chapter 8. Now, Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And it's right here that Peter actually gets the right answer. Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Peter, the loudmouthed disciple, is finally starting to get it. Jesus is the God-man, the long-awaited Messiah, and he says so out loud. But that doesn't mean he really understands what it means, because within a matter of minutes he gets the wrong answer. Here's the way the story continues down in verse 30. Then he, that's Jesus, strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. Now, let me pause there for a moment, because this is a pretty big thought. Even though his own disciples are starting to recognize who Jesus is, he warns them to keep their mouth shut. This is something that Bible scholars refer to as the Messianic secret. Mark is giving his readers a really clear picture of who Jesus is, but at the same time we see Jesus revealing himself very slowly to the disciples. In Mark chapter 1, when some demons recognize Christ, he tells them to be quiet. When Jesus heals a leper, he warns him not to tell anybody how he was healed. When he raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead, he tells the ruler of the synagogue to keep the miracle quiet. What we find is a steady progression of understanding with people becoming more and more aware that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And that's really the primary task of Mark's Gospel. It's designed to convince you of the same thing. And the author wants you to come to the conclusion for yourself so it's a gradual, progressive revelation, the same way the story slowly goes uphill. But back to the story now, where Peter has just confessed that Jesus is the Christ at Caesarea Philippi, the very place where pagans celebrated the blending of human and divine. The story continues now in verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. This is the turning point in Mark's Gospel. The story started down in the lowlands by the Jordan River, and it continually moves uphill to this point where Messiah is finally revealed. And that's where the story starts going downhill again, because after this, Jesus starts moving toward Jerusalem, the place where He's going to suffer and die. 
So try to imagine the impact. Peter has just figured out who Jesus really is, and now he's being told that Messiah is going to suffer unbelievable humiliation. The story continues in verse 32. It says, Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So now he's bawling out Jesus for saying such a horrible thing. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, when Matthew tells this same story, he includes the bit where Jesus tells Peter that he is a rock. It's a redemptive moment, a slightly more positive recollection of what happened. But Mark leaves that out, which only strengthens my suspicion that this is really Peter's gospel, because it really doesn't have a lot of good to say about Peter. It demonstrates the humility that Peter eventually developed. From this point at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus immediately goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration, where three of His disciples see Him revealed in His full glory. So, let's have a look at that narrative over in chapter 9, and I'll just read you the whole thing. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and He was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves. So this is the really big revelation, the Son of God in all His glory. And now the reader knows who Jesus really, really is. And from here, the story starts going downhill toward Jerusalem, toward the cross. And I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. One of the words that Mark frequently uses throughout his gospel account is another telltale sign, at least I think, that this is probably the work of Peter. It's the Greek word eutheos, which means immediately or straight away, and it emphasizes immediate action. If this is the gospel of the ox, the gospel of a faithful servant, then you'd expect to see a lot of labor and a lot of action. And the word eutheos makes a huge splash right in the opening chapter. Let me show you what I mean. At the baptism of Jesus, we read this in Mark chapter 1. It says, And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then right after that it says, Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And then right after that, Jesus calls his first disciples, Simon and Andrew, and the text says, They immediately left their nets and followed Him. Then He sees James and John, and it says, And immediately He called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and went after Him. This word shows up again and again and again and again and again, and that's because Mark is trying to show us action. It's a book with a very fast pace, connecting one story to the next in a rapid-fire way, and it's trying to give us the impression that Jesus was very intentional. He was working hard to save us. I'm convinced that this is one of the reasons you find the hand of Jesus mentioned so often in the book of Mark. In the Bible, the hand is a symbol for work like we find in the book of Ecclesiastes, where it tells us whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Mark is the record of Jesus doing His earthly business with all His might, with His hand. So in this gospel, Jesus takes Peter's mother-in-law, it says, by the hand and heals her. He sees a leper 
A man who has been denied any kind of human touch for a really, really long time. And it says that Jesus was moved with compassion and he reached out and touched him. When Jairus pleads for his daughter, Jesus takes the girl, it says, by the hand and raises her from the dead. He uses his hand to heal a deaf man. And the same thing happens for a blind man. In other words, Jesus is the hand of God working in this world to save our broken humanity. And then the narrative takes us to the death of Christ, an event that occupies one third of this gospel. By comparison, Mark skips over the ministry of Christ very, very quickly. And then he slows down dramatically to focus on Jesus' final week, where the faithful servant does his most important work. He takes the sin of humanity on himself, he ascends to the cross, and he gives his life for us. And what's really curious about the story that Mark tells is how little space it devotes to what happens after Jesus rose from the dead. In the other Gospels, we have detailed accounts of post-resurrection encounters, but that's not what you find in Mark's account. Now, to be perfectly honest, I'm not exactly sure why this is, except to say that the death of Christ is the focal point for Mark. This is where the story was headed from the moment he wrote the first words. Christ was willing to serve humanity to the point of giving His life to save us. And curiously enough, of the four faces of the cherubim, the ox is the only clean animal, the only one suitable for sacrifice in the temple. And I think that Peter really wanted to draw our attention to that. Over in his first letter, Peter writes these words. He says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In the second gospel account, we see that the life and death of Jesus should make a difference. You cannot possibly stand beside Peter and see Jesus as he reveals himself and somehow not be changed by that. You cannot join Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration and see Jesus in all His glory and then just go back to regular life as if you'd never noticed anything at all. I'll be right back after this. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Well, there I go again. I've been yabbering so long that I'm starting to run out of time. But I don't want to end today's episode without focusing on the very end of Mark's gospel, or maybe it's Peter's gospel. I think one of the strangest things about the way Mark's gospel ends is just how abrupt it seems. It looks as if the original version of this book ended with these words that you find written in Mark 16, verse 8. It says, So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, if you look at the marginal notes in some Bibles, you'll see that some scholars believe that those were the original closing words of this gospel. What we think happened is that in later years, another faithful disciple, another follower of Jesus, filled in the story with a few extra verses, a brief wrap-up that includes a couple of post-resurrection appearances by Jesus and a version of the Great Commission, where Jesus sends His disciples to share the news of salvation with the rest of the world. But the original version, the oldest one, seems to end with an empty tomb and some frightened disciples. And that's really a very strange place to end a story if you think about it, because it's not the way that most people would do it. If this really is Peter's account of the life of Jesus, there's something missing here. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that after Jesus rose from the dead, He appeared to Peter privately, almost as if He was finishing the discussion that happened at Caesarea Philippi up on the mountain. 
Or maybe it was a private meeting to wrap up some of the unfinished business that came out of Peter's betrayal. So if this gospel written by Mark is actually Peter's account, the way that the earliest church insisted, then you'd think that Peter would include a meeting between himself and Jesus. But it doesn't. And we don't really know why. It just ends very suddenly with a note of fear, with confused and frightened disciples. Now, some people have speculated that maybe Mark was suddenly arrested at this point and didn't have time to finish off the story. Other people think maybe it was designed this way on purpose to leave you hanging so that you have to finish the story yourself. You have to come to terms with Jesus in your own way, and the story that Peter started has now come to you personally. After climbing the mountain to see who Jesus really was, and then following Him down the mountain all the way to the cross, maybe Mark is saying, listen, now you have a choice to make, just like Peter did up on that mountain. Everybody who meets Jesus has to respond somehow. And there are two ways you can respond. Either you read this account of Jesus of Nazareth and you find faith, or you're confronted by this glorious Jesus on the mountain and you succumb to fear. And now you have to decide which one you will be. You know, maybe it's been a while since you've read a copy of the Bible. In this day and age, maybe there's a chance you've never actually read it at all. If you're going to read it, I'd suggest you start with the Gospel of Mark. Why? Well, it's short enough. You could really read this in one sitting. It's not very long. And by reading it, you're going to get a powerful sense of who Jesus is, or more accurately, who Jesus claims to be. And you might just be surprised to find what you've been looking for in life. You might just find the thing that you knew was out there, but didn't know where to look. Pay attention to the details in this account. Pay attention to how Jesus relates to real, everyday people, how He interacts with them. And ask yourself, who was this man? Was this really just another guru, another spiritual teacher like all the rest? Is Jesus just another prophet like Elijah or Moses or John? Or is He the Son of God? I mean, if He is, if He really is God in human flesh, I'd think you'd owe it to yourself to sit down and examine these claims for yourself. I know there are a lot of books about Jesus out there, and you can find a lot of books about the Bible. But this book, and this gospel in particular, was written by a man who was willing to die upside down on a cross for what he discovered on that mountainside. And I'd think that would make you more than a little bit curious. I'm Sean Boonstra. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Authentic. Mm -hmm.